views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey there, it is time for the Bronx Buzz. We're over here, it's time for the Bronx Buzz, and uh, we're having a good time here in the studio. We're talking a little baseball. We were sorry to hear that uh, Frank Robinson died, but that has nothing to do with what we're doing on the show today. Uh, of course, uh, this is the program where you get to meet Bronx journalists, Bronx writers, Bronx photographers, sometimes videographers, and we give you a little insight as to uh, what they're thinking about and what they're doing when they write the stuff that they write. And uh, this evening we have two excellent Bronx journalists with us. We'll start off with Joseph Koenig and Joe, drum roll please, ladies and gentlemen, got the cover of City and State magazine with his story about the, what they called the new machine, Bronx politics. Congratulations on the cover story. Thank you, Gary. So you, we rarely see um, uh, young journalists like yourself who, listen, you haven't been in the business all those yeah, many years, true. to get a uh, to get a cover story of a, of a real important topical issue. Yeah. Uh, is there any, any, any tale to tell about how it came about? Um, or we're just going to launch right into the, the, the tech, the, the content? Uh, my dear friend, Jeff Colton, uh, who works, he's a reporter there at City and State. He connected me with the editors there, and uh, I'm eternally grateful. Um, we're going to get into, uh, and you know, we're going to talk about Bronx politics yes. here and get into, I mean, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is right on the cover, and, uh, you know, the, the story really um, was expansive, really, and for people interested in Bronx politics, as far as I could tell, and I, of course, read everything that comes out, um, this was as good a chronicle and as good a study of what's going on now well, as any. But um, just let's talk about the creation of it. Um, in, did you have a lot of the material? Had you already inter interviewed the people? Or did you go about, pick up the phone and say, you know, hey, uh, I'm doing a story on and literally start from scratch? No, I, I, I think uh, I basically conducted about 30 or 40 interviews for this story. Wow. And so there's, you know, however many people are quoted in it, for every person that's quoted, there's five more that weren't quoted. And I basically, I, I called up people, I talked to them, I interviewed them, and then at the end of every interview, I was like, give me five names of people I should talk to. And wow. I, didn't get, I didn't get to everyone, but I tried to talk to as many people who are on the ground and involved as possible so I could best, you know, capture it without, you know, you, I mean, I could write a 500-page book, and that would be more detailed than well, this. Well, this is the, I was thinking this is the beginning of that right, book. Right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know what um, is uh, interesting to me about that, um, me, um, Patrick Rocchio, who's going to join us in the yeah. Bronx Times, and many other uh, Bronx journalists. We've been covering this stuff for a very long time. It was interesting to me, and, and frankly a credit to you, that you did such a thorough job and something that even someone like me would be interested in reading, that it wasn't rehashed. And you gave it, I, I think, a, a fresh analysis, which for those of us who cover this stuff all the time, may be a little bit hard to do. You know, because we know all of it, already. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Were there revelations in here that you uh, said, wow, that's, a, you know, things that you didn't know or things that you, you were like, I'm really happy to report this? Well, I think the stuff about who the activists and these organizers that helped support Ocasio-Cortez and Alessandro Biagi want to, they, they, these people want to, you know, they want to keep the ball rolling. They want to primary people in 2020 and 2021. So I think that was interesting because obviously it's way early to, to talk about that. But, you know, one of the things that they said to me is that the groundwork that was laid for the for the Biagi uh, victory and for the Ocasio-Cortez victory was not, was, it, it began long before they even officially announced their ca uh, candidacies. Like the the no IDC efforts were going on for years before she decided to become exactly a exactly. Right. So the, it, it was a, a lot of the information about the legwork that is necessary, and it was just interesting to hear about who they're looking at next because. Uh, they're who, really start when you say they. What do you mean? I mean, I meant the general, you know, the movement, the progressive grassroots groups. I see. Uh, who they're looking at next, and who they're laying the groundwork to, to you know, take the out next. Take on, yeah, so yeah. to speak. I, you know, I will tell you. You mentioned uh, Alessandro Biaggi um, and and um, Jeff Klein's campaign in the IDC, and yeah. that was really, you know, the beginning of the end in a way for for uh, former Senator Klein. Um, I was not aware of a a movement that would unseat Joe Crowley 
until she really did it. And looking back, I could look at the entire grassroots movement in the South right. Bronx, and what you say is true, I personally, and I think many other journalists and other people, never identified it as such until she used it and proved it to be victorious. Well, I think, I think I, do I have that right? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that there's a lot of individuals that um, were very upset with the status quo, and as we know how things work in the Bronx and in New York City in general, is there's very low voter turnout in primaries, especially in special elections, especially, but uh, in generals, of course. But so what these what these activists who worked behind for Ocasio Cortez and helped get her elected did is they targeted people who had never voted before and they brought got them to the polls. Brought them to the polls, and s even still, if you look at the numbers in the primary, you know it's like technically like 15 percent, or uh, that's not exactly what it is, but it's a very small percentage of the actual electorate. And so what these people are going to focus on going forward is they're going to focus less on winning over people who vote every election and f f focus more on bringing, bringing new, new voters. People. Yeah, exactly. So here's what I told you that I was going to uh, bring up what my beef is, not okay. necessarily with your reporting, <laughs> truthfully, okay, okay. because I really, I, I love the article. It's, it's expansive. If you haven't seen it, go look up City and State online and, and you'll get it. Yeah. But now when City and State did the promotion for it, and, and look at these photographs, if we can get a, a picture of these photographs. Uh, over here is uh, Ms. Uh, or now Senator Biaggi, and here is Representative um, Ocasio Cortez. When when the city and state put it out, they did the cutout and they put the two of them, like like high fiving yeah. each other, right? They they cut the two pictures together, and then elsewhere in this article is um, uh, local activist Michael Belzer. Um, with both of them. And right. here's what my point is. I have interviewed Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on Bronxnet Television. I have interviewed Alessandra Biaggi on Bronxnet Television. Right. They are two different people Absolutely. with two different political philosophies. You captured it in the article, but the problem is the image is, especially because of the similarities of their names, they're the same person. And people who oppose some of the things they stand for lump them together in one box. They have different sets of experiences. They're working with different constituents. And I perceive them as two totally different people. If they one was a woman and one was a man, if they you know didn't have similar names, right. then I have a feeling people would perceive that. But it becomes very easy to say, this is the progressive movement of the Bronx. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say this. I really <laughs> wanted to say this for a long time. Well, I, I, I said it. I think I think you're right. And and for for what it's worth, you know, Biagi didn't have any support from the Bronx establishment, but she definitely had support from uh, establishment figures in Albany and throughout New York State because you know Democrats in Albany were not particularly happy with Jeff right. Klein. They were ready for, for a change, and that, that was noticed all over the and, place. But, and that was not the case with the Ocasio-Cortez election. I mean, Ocasio-Cortez had virtually zero support from any kind of establishment figure. Um, and, and so I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a convenient narrative to lump them together. They're both progressive. They're both women. They're both young. I mean, uh, Biagi's 31. Uh, Ocasio-Cortez is 29. Um, but... Uh, so I agree that they're not, they're definitely in different individuals, you know, Akaji Cortez is a democratic socialist, Biagi is, a, is just a progressive, but uh, I think it's, an, it's a convenient narrative because they both won in the same year, and, it, and it, it's, a, it's a starting point for what these activists and organizers believe is a, a true change coming you to the You have done a very good job at yeah. responding to what I said <laughs> because you helped define it, you helped yeah. define it for people, and, and I will just um, tell you that in... Um, uh, and I forget which which interview it was with Senator Biaggi, in that I asked her directly this kind of a yeah, question. Yeah. Are you the same person? And she made it very clear, I'm not a socialist, I'm not a no. democratic socialist, right. I'm a Democrat. Right. And so anyway, that, that's been kind of a, um, a, a beef of mine. <laughs> do you think, based on the things that you wrote, do you think that we are in for more surprises in the Bronx. Do you perceive that maybe there will be some incumbents? I, I mean, there are photographs of um, uh, Fernando Cabrera, Mark Joni, and um, uh, Council Member uh, Diaz, uh, Reverend Diaz, Senior, in here. Yes. Uh, do you think that there, that there will be the kinds of challenges we saw this time to defeat uh, people like that, that there is some background about or some undercurrent about. For, for sure, and I think I think you, the so you think the movement is strong and strong here to stay. I, I think I think it's here to stay. I think what helps 
is, uh, is that Donald Trump is the president, and that might seem counterintuitive, but I think it gets more, the, the fact that Donald Trump is president gets more people involved, gets more people educated, and when they look at people like uh, Reverend Ruben Diaz, who is a conservative Democrat, that does not uh, match with their 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 worldview, and so in the, in the Bronx specifically, in the Bronx uh, specifically. generally, not to say that ever, because believe me, we know there are pockets, and actually, Patrick Rocchio represents a, a, you know constituents who don't feel the way that you just right. Talking. But I'm saying that these activists who are behind Ocasio Cortez, who are behind Biagi, uh, they feel empowered, they feel energized, and they have more and more people joining them every day. Now, that's not to say that the Bronx establishment and that the the, the elected officials mentioned in this article are not going to be more prepared next time. I mean, Joe Crowley, as we know, was blindsided. Jeff Klein spent $3 million to, to, to uh, push back on Biagi. But, uh, but I think next time, the Bronx establishment and these elected officials are going to be much better prepared. I just think that the, the Bronx progressives are going to be better prepared as well. Uh, here, here's where I'm going to say, we're going to use this to conclude. Um, it's very, <coughs> excuse me, it's very interesting that you talk about it as you know, us versus them. It would be interesting if the Bronx establishment would incorporate more of those ideals because those are democratic. Voters. I mean, Gary, you've been <laughs> covering the Bronx establishment for a while. I knew you what were do you say think? <laughs> I, I, you see, I'm so, to this day, I'm even more naive than a young reporter. <laughs> There's no about question that. about it. Uh, Joe, it is such a pleasure. Next Thank time you so we'll, much, Gary. but you're still at the Norwood News. Still even working you the had the big News. feature. Yes. Congratulations yes. on the big feature. Thank you. And um, we'll look for your stuff in the Norwood News. Thank and you thanks so much. for being with of us course, today. Of course, of course. Thanks for setting me straight. <laughs> Good I don't job. Know about that. Uh, we're going to be right back. And as I mentioned, Patrick Rocchio, uh, the assignment editor at the Bronx Times, is in the wings. He'll be right with us. Don't go away. Sure, I look cute now, but when my owner lost his job, it was rough. I was living on the street, and one night, me and this Cocker Spaniel got into it so bad, I wound up looking like an ice cream cone. I cried a little bit, but thankfully I got rescued, so I'm running, I'm jumping, all back to my old self, and I'm ready to give unconditional love, even if you put a lampshade on my head. It's not always easy being a dad. Do you have panda asthma too? Does that run in the family? This is the home of the most priceless kung fu artifacts. But when you make an effort... Dad, we're not supposed to touch anything. Oh, sorry. Go along, son. It's always worth it. Whoa, master! The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. I am gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more. You know what, guys? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. from Vivo's Do It Your Selfie, where we recreate the hottest looks from today's biggest music videos. After cleaning out our closet, we have a lot of clothes we don't wear anymore. Like this old t-shirt. It's not garbage, it's actually a brand new rug. And to make it, all you need to do is cut, tie, and glue. Cut the t-shirt into strips. Tie the strips into knots. And glue the knots to the bath mat. I love it. Give your garbage another life. And recycle.
apparently I made an error that uh, Patrick Rocchio pointed out when he sat down because I was talking about his coverage area, the people that he serves with the Bronx Times, and I used the word constituents. Patrick Rocchio is a reporter, assignment editor, not an elected official. He has no constituents. He has readers. <laughs> yeah, readers. Readers. He has readers. readers. He has people in his coverage area, that, et cetera. Right. I apologize for that. Anyway, no but now I will say something nice. Congratulations on your wedding. Oh, I thank know you. It was lovely. We all saw photos and your beautiful wife. Are you happy being married? Yes, okay. yes, very happy. In, in a word, yes. All right, we ready for business? All right, let's go. Okay, Patrick, uh, Simon, editor at the Bronx Times, wrote this. Um, it, it seems like a simple story that there are uh, a, a truck, trailer trucks parked along uh, Bruckner Boulevard uh, over there by Wilkinson and uh, what was the other cross street? Uh, Wilkinson and Middletown. And Middletown Road, okay? Right. And they're parked there. Seems like a harmless thing. People don't like it. They got uh, the council member to get the police to write tickets, and now the dialogue is going: Where do they park? Where you know what's the right thing to do? Give me a little background about you know why this became such a thing. Sure, I mean it's been a long-standing issue for a number of years, for as as long as I've been a reporter, and and I think before that, and. Uh, Basically, you don't want to ask how many years that is. Okay. Uh, a number of years. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, it, it flares up every now and again. Uh, particularly in winter, I think this tends to happen. And really? it's a, why, why would that be? Uh, because in summer, you know, uh, in, in summer, from what I hear, um, a, a lot of this parking takes place on the weekends. And in summer, a lot of those spaces are filled. Though you will see. Truck, filled with, 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 uh, with, with people going to the park. Oh, I see. So that there's no place for the trucks. Right, right. Oh. Though, uh, though, um, though we, you know, I mean, we do see it year-round, mm -hmm. even in the summer. And and why does it rankle people so much if it, they, you know, they're, they're they're not doing anything? I think it's just. And I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm not disagreeing with the people, but I'm just trying to. get Well, I mean, one, you know, being they are parked illegally. Ah, that's the first it, thing. You know, okay. that's the first thing. It is illegal uh, to, to, to park it for a long period of time. Um, two, the drivers are not in the trucks, so where are they? In many cases, they're not. It's, it's not like they're taking a rest in most cases. Right. They seem to be storing the vehicles there. So that also, um, you know, it's not a transient thing. They could be there for five days, right. four or five days. It generally takes place on the weekends. Some, some have theorized that the drivers um, live nearby and are just parking their vehicles there, go visit with their families before they get back on the road. And go somewhere else. We don't know that for sure. I think That's that was one of the things sure. you did bring up in, right. the, in the story. That's not for sure. I mean, uh, so, so now, okay, let's just well, you know, follow, follow the leader here. So then um, uh, Council Member Joe and I got, heard from constituents, got to the NYPD, and now they're ticketing these, these trucks. Um, Two things. One of them I think you brought up in your article, and that is, well, you know what? Maybe it costs more to find a place to park the vehicle uh, than it does to just get a ticket and pay whatever it is for the, the fine for parking. So, you know, six and one half a dozen the other. And that's along with the second part of my question. Where do they go if, in fact, they need to be? In the, this is kind of a midpoint before they get to the George Washington Bridge or do something else. Where else would they or could they go, uh, you know, or do we not, should we not have sympathy for the truck drivers who are involved? Well, in that's the just the problem, Gary. There is no <laughs> place in the city for truck drivers to go. Right. So they have a stretch between New Jersey and really Connecticut on 95. Right, they could 95. be coming from farther north, from right. Illinois, Maine, or sure, Illinois, sure. Down, and going from there to New Jersey and beyond. I so, mean, I mean, Washington, so, you know, so I mean, that's the question. There are storage yards, yeah. where, you know, private storage yards where, you know, you can pay a fee and store a vehicle, I'm sure. You know, there are arrangements that can be made. I can't imagine, uh, certainly in the Bronx, a Bronx community that will say, hey, I got a good idea. Let's park tractor trailers in our neighborhood, right? Well, Probably you know, not. I mean, and, and, and I did get a lot of feedback on that story. Uh, I mean, a, well, what a, a would lot people meaning. say? You know, other, other areas, other other locations where this is an issue, and um, I'm familiar with some of them. Um, you, you know, uh, and we periodically do stories on them. It's sort of um, it's sort of like an issue that flares up every now and again, in right. in certain locations, usually where there's not 
like a lot of people living there. It may be like partially industrial. Right. And so, or which is which is park. why they get used like that because people aren't living there. They say, "Look, who are we really disturbing?" I know, and you know, I, as you know, I live in the other part of the Bronx where mm -hmm. the Jerome Park Reservoir mm -hmm. is, and not as not really recently. I don't recall seeing it recently, but through history, along that stretch between, let's say, Bronx Science and Dewitt Clinton. Uh, there are a lot of uh, vehicles that d do tend to park there. I think they were also uh, ticketed out, so to speak. I've they, seen it there. Yeah. I have seen it there. All right, ongoing. You know, it's an ongoing, ongoing story. Yeah. Yep. Give, keep, it's something to keep Patrick out of trouble while he's married. <laughs> anyway, the, this other story you wrote, I, I think, is a fascinating thing. Everybody knows about Amazon coming to Queens and the controversy of that. That's sure. uh, another. Uh, time in another place, but they are uh, developing what they call a last mile delivery uh, spot in Hunts Point. Right. Um, why don't you describe what that is, and I will relate to you uh, an interview I did on BronxNet on Bronx Talk uh, with um, uh, Council Member Salamanca after you tell me your point of view here. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, well uh, this is about a week or two ago. Um, uh, 1300 Vale Avenue in the, uh, in the Hunts Point section of the Bronx. Uh, uh, it, it, it was reported, but not really fleshed out, that, that there had been a uh, 120,000 square foot warehouse that had been leased to Amazon. So I looked into it, checked into it, and uh, in, indeed I got an Amazon spokeswoman on the phone and uh, she uh, sort of walked me through everything. And uh, it was, uh, it, they are doing a last mile facility there. Um, it's going to include. Um, they're going to make use of a couple of different programs, including one called Amazon Flex, which is like a, uh, a delivery, uh, almost like an Uber delivery service right. t t type arrangement. And that would be for all, to deliver all over, presumably, to New York City. Right. Let's say you know somebody has a truck and wants to work for four hours. Well, if they're in the Amazon Flex program, they might be able to do that. I'm not sure what, uh, I'm not too clear on the particulars, but... Is, that, is that this predicated be. on uh, Amazon uh, completing that deal and getting approved for Long Island City, or you think this is here regardless because people uh, in the New York metro area in New York City are ordering from Amazon anyway? The impression that I get is that it, it, it is not related to that. What um, and, and you are no are sensitive to this, and you hear it all the time. What people in the Bronx are concerned about is another trucking business in the South Bronx coming out of Hunts Point. It's like enough is enough. Uh, what I understood from the council member, and I asked him about this on Bronx Talk, that's the program that's actually running this week, is he said, in a way, there's nothing you can do. It was private property. It's as of right. You know, it wasn't the kind of thing mm -hmm. that had to go through a community sure. board. It was just simply a, a um, uh, you know, a, um, a for-profit company, an independent company getting space and taking space. Well, it is a warehouse. I mean, a warehouse with, you know, a trucking bay, so it's built yeah. for that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess that and, uh, um, that is, is the case. Um, let's just real briefly, you did write about it, and I don't want to say it's already old news, but it is... Um, uh, it, was, it, yeah. it, was a, it, it, it was a few weeks ago now. Okay, we're talking about the Metro North um, right. agreement with Amtrak, so I, I'll give you the background is that uh, you know, everybody was all hepped up in the Bronx about the four new uh, Metro North stations coming to the Bronx. But there was a sticking point because Amtrak really owned the tracks and they needed to cut a deal so that it could be used. And then there was a question, is Amtrak holding up this big deal? But ultimately they uh, came to agreement. Um, w was there a sticking point or was it just a matter of getting Amtrak and Metro North to sit together and figure this out? There was a sticking point over track access fees because Amtrak owns the right of way that would lead the Metro North uh, trains uh, on, on the new route that would go through the Bronx into Penn Station. Right. Uh, where Metro North trains typically, uh, uh, you know, there's a... It, Termin I thought terminated at Grand Central. Yeah, but, th yeah. but this would be different. <laughs> right, so. and, and this is a really a big thing because now we're talking about transportation from the East Bronx to the west side of Manhattan. What a... Wow. Uh, with tremendous revelation. Um, since you have obviously covered the, this part of the Bronx for many, many, many years, um, talk to me about what you think the real impact will be of those rail stations. Like, what, what will really change? Is it, is it going to be more for commuters and or 
how much is it going to really spur what many people are talking about, a development in the areas of Parkchester, Van Ness, uh, Morris Park, Hunts Point, Co-op well, City? Well, I've been told that in the Morris Park um, train station, that areas around that are either being rezoned or in the process of being rezoned for larger a de a developments. It's going to mean a lot for the, for the for, you know for that for, for the people already there. Do you when you say development, are we talking about residential or commercial? Residential. Residential. So people will find more reasons to live there. Right. Currently, because you can just jump on the train. Transportation. And yeah. Transportation is an issue. Well, you know this, and, and I'm, I'm sure people watching us who live in the East Bronx would think right away, well, that's nice. But if you don't put in schools, if you don't build other infrastructures, mm, mm -hmm. improve our transportation, sure. um, I'm not talking about rail transportation, then you're going to, you know, you're, you're not going to make our lives better. I mean, people will bring money in, but it may not make our lives better. Even for the people already living there, it would be a tremendous, tremendous help because that would open up job opportunities. It would open up much, it would, it would mean much shorter commutes, uh, you know, to working in Manhattan. And that, in and of itself would make the area far more attractive. We have in those areas, specifically Co-op City, and we're talking about Hunts Point, I mean, we have real transportation deserts currently in the Bronx, and mm -hmm. this definitely is one of the solutions. Actually, I don't remember if you wrote the story or not, but the whole idea of the uh, uh, Ferry Point uh, uh, Ferry is an interesting I did. beast, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. You, and, and for similar reasons, it's going to be an advantage. Oh, of course, of course, of yeah. course. And that's coming much sooner in 2021. This isn't going to happen easier right to away. easier to put a ferry on a boat on the river. Right, right. 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 Well, the, but the, the one thing, as you know, yeah. um, the Class and Point ferry, I don't want to say it's a disaster, but it's definitely a problem. There's no parking. Mm -hmm. Ferry Point, there's a lot of room for parking. Oh, there they is. They can figure that out. There's already a parking lot. It needs to be resurfaced. Well, and there is additional space where the, where the toll booths, which have now been removed from the White Stone, Bronx White Stone Bridge, are. So, um, so, so, so there's definitely options to develop parking spaces there. Right. All right. Listen, Patrick Rocchio, always a pleasure to have you with us. It's Say nice hello to, to all here, our Gary. friends at the Bronx Times. Congratulations again. My, the young man got married. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Well, thank uh, you, Gary. So we'll see you around town. Yeah. Uh, we are going to um, uh, say goodnight, and uh, so I'm going to go over here. Can I do that? Can I go over here? No? Can I go over here? There we go. I'm going to go over here and say goodnight and tell you that uh, Monday night on uh, Bronx Talk, we're going to be doing the show on community boards. We'll have community board seven and community board six represented talk about those parts of the Bronx. Say goodbye, Patrick. Good night. Good night. <laughs> See you next oh, time. Good morning. Good morning.